Okay, welcome uh, to the India International Center. Uh, as you are probably aware, we are uh, celebrating the 60th anniversary of the founding of uh, India International Center. And throughout this anniversary here, year, we are having a number of events uh, to celebrate uh, this anniversary. Uh, one of the important uh, topics that we have taken up uh, for uh, uh, discussion and deliberation and debate uh, is one of digital uh, governance. And we have a cluster of uh, several experts and scholars who are really looking at uh, how digital governance, particularly for a country like India, uh, how this could be improved, how could this become a major driver of economic and social development in the uh, country. Um, in this uh, context, uh, we are extremely privileged and honored uh, to have with us uh, today Dr. Sumitra uh, Dada, who is uh, uh, currently, uh, you know, the uh, the dean elect of the Said School of uh, uh, Business at Oxford um, University, and uh, he is also a professor of management and the former founding dean of the SC Johnson's College of Business at Cornell University in New York. Uh, he's the founder of uh, Global Innovation Index, published by the World Intellectual Property Organization, and was the co-founder of the Global Information Technology Report, uh, which is published by the World Economic Forum, two very influential reports in uh, the field of technology and innovation policy. Uh, he's also the co-founder and president of Portulan Institute, a non-partisan non-profit research and education institution uh, based in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, Professor Data is on the global board of the Dassault uh, Systems. He is also a member of the uh, Shareholder Council of Chicago-based healthcare consulting company, ZS Associates. In addition, he is a member of uh, advisory boards of several uh, business uh, schools. And uh, he is also the co-founder of two firms, uh, Fisheye Analytics, which was acquired by the WPP Group, and Egesia, a digital learning and edutech company. He is currently chair of the board of directors of the Global Business School uh, Network, a Washington, D.C.-based not-for-profit organization focused on improving management capacity in emerging markets. Uh, Professor Data received a B.Tech in computer science from the Indian Institute of Technology, New Delhi, uh, MS in both business administration and computer science, and a PhD in computer science from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, in 2017, he received the Distinguished Alumnus Award uh, from his alma mater, uh, ISD uh, Delhi. Um, welcome, uh, Professor Data, to our to our uh, uh, you know IIC's lecture series. Um, uh, Professor Data is uh, particularly uh, known for uh, the uh, work that he has done in creating this very well-known uh, network uh, readiness index, which is uh, really a kind of a multi-dimensional uh, concept. Uh, it is uh, really looking at uh, you know four key pillars that he has spoken about. Uh, these uh, these pillars uh, are. Uh, uh, you know, um, in in technology, uh, people, uh, governance, and impact. And of course, there are various, as I understand, subcategories under each of these uh, pillars. Um, in the last report that uh, has been presented, the uh, readiness uh, index, uh, what uh, really struck me was also the fact that uh, India, which is perhaps uh, not always known in the in the category of uh, uh, you know, uh, countries which are progressing very quickly in the technology field, uh, that India has actually done quite well in terms of the uh, global, uh, you know, network readiness uh, index. Uh, so I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Professor Datta, and uh, uh, he will be speaking to us uh, this evening about, uh, you know, the whole aspect of uh, network readiness of uh, nations. Uh, how we are really looking at combining uh, technology and humanity uh, for a better uh, future. Uh, Professor Datta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much and good evening to everyone in India and a very good day to everyone else, regardless of which location and geography you are in. 
Uh, it's an honor and pleasure, Shyam, to be invited to speak to you all. Uh, and congratulations to the India International Center for your 60th anniversary. I think you have a great organization and I'm very pleased to be part of your celebrations. Technology has been a very important influence in I think all our lives over the last several decades. My own involvement in technology, of course, started early when I you know, was a student in computer science and I had Delhi in the mid eighties. And I must say that my interests were initially quite technical in nature, given my own studies in computer science. But then I started my career in a business school at NCR in France. So I already got sort of, you know, moved quite early on to a more business orientation technology. And I remember distinctly that when I first started my you know, first year as a professor, young professor in INSEAD in 89, uh, technology was not really high on the agenda. Technology was seen as a back office operational support system. And how the role of technology has evolved in business over the last 30, 35 years is absolutely amazing. I mean, today when I go and talk about technology to companies, for many organizations, the business strategy is synonymous with technology strategy. And it's almost impossible to make the distinction between what is business and what is technology today for most sectors. So technology has really become a core of the business strategy of most companies. My engagement with the more national level debate on technology started out as an accident actually initially. I was invited to take part in the World Economic Forum meetings in 2000, 2001. And in those days in the Davos meetings, you know, technology was early years of commercialization of the internet. Internet had just sort of started out getting used in different parts of the world. We had seen the emergence, <coughs> sorry, we seen the emergence of the first internet companies like you know, Amazon and eBay that went public in the mid nineties. And we started seeing stories of uh, use of technology in creative ways. For example, farmers in India who are checking commodity prices in Chicago before deciding when to sell the crops. Or fishermen in Malawi who were coordinating and communicating with technology to avoid overfishing in their waters. And there were a number of anecdotes like this of how technology was improving people's lives. And the World Economic Forum put together a small group. I was one of the group of four. And they told us, well, look, why don't you give us or come up with some kind of a framework to think about how technology can actually help the development of nations? You know, back then, 20, 22 years ago, a lot of the debate around technology was very much focused on bits and bytes, on bandwidth, on whether you had PCs in schools or home penetration of computers. It, the discussion was very much technology oriented. And when we had the small group uh, that actually came together to look at the future of technology for the development of nations, we quickly realized that uh, we had to look much broader than just the mere technical aspects. Technical aspects were important, but we had to go a little bigger and broader in vision out there. Now, looking back, you know, the work we did 22 years ago was quite far-sighted. Um, at that moment, we were early on in, in fact, identifying that the political environment of a country, the regulatory environment of a country, the social norms and mores of a country were all very important in deciding how technology would impact that country. Today, it seems obvious, you know, given how technology has impacted our lives, it seems obvious about how technology is influenced by political developments, how technology influences politics, how regulatory aspects influence technology. But believe me, back in 2000, 2001, it wasn't obvious at all. So in fact, we put forward a framework that had you know, multiple aspects to it, but the two major aspects were one, 
the environment in which technology was being used in the country. The environment consisted of multiple aspects, you know, political, regulatory, social, and so on. And second was the usage of the technology in the country. So how much technology was being used by different actors in the country, which typically revolved around the three major actors, you know, individuals, businesses, and governments. We wanted to use measures for impact, but we were challenged to actually find measures for impact because our goal was to measure this globally, not just only for the rich OECD countries. And so trying to find measures that truly captured impact were a big challenge then and remains a challenge even today. And I'll just to give a simple example, computers were getting used in schools then and today. But we know that uh, just looking at the penetration of computers in the classroom is not really a good measure of how effective the learning is in terms of outcomes. Because you need to change the pedagogy. You need to actually give special skills to teachers to be able to change the way they teach. You also need to be able to link what the students are learning with the eventual you know, carry outcomes or future education outcomes they choose. So actually to measure the outcome or the benefit of using technology, the impact of using technology in the classroom is actually quite complicated because you link it to the right output measure. The output measure being, you know, are they learning something? Are the carry outcomes? Are the education outcomes being achieved as planned? You also have to look at all the intermediate steps that have to go into play to actually enable that outcome to happen. So we were very challenged in finding variables on those impact dimensions. So even though we knew impact was very important, we could not find the right variables being collected in the various 100 plus countries of interest to us. So the initial model of the index, which we termed as the network readiness index, really focused on elements around the environment and around the usage. The usage was really a proxy of uh, perhaps the impact of technology on society, on business. Now that effort was very rewarding, I think. <clears throat> Many governments picked up that piece of work. And for almost 15 years, I think 16 years to be more precise, we published a report from the World Economic Forum. And uh, I was a co-editor of the report for 16 years of the World Economic Forum. And that report really influenced the technology policies, technology decisions of many countries around the world. Because you know the challenge is when you are a minister of technology in a country or some kind of a senior leader responsible to technology impact, you need some kind of a conceptual framework to think about technology because technology can be anywhere and everywhere. And it's like the classical story of you know, touching an elephant and you know, a blind man touching an elephant. And you can touch one part and feel something. You touch another part, feel something else. And you actually might make the wrong judgment or the, make the wrong decisions. You need to have that holistic view to be able to understand this animal, this, you know, this whole range of what technology represents, and then to be able to take the right decisions. So really, in some sense, the benefit that I think our work brought to the technology policy debate was giving some kind of a conceptual anchor to the whole discussion. Now, over the years, you know, we did evolve the discussion. We did evolve the framework incrementally over time. At one major re overhaul, I think maybe done about 10 years ago, we did uh, also include impact variables. And then what happened was around 2017, so about five years ago, the World Economic Forum, for a number of internal reasons, uh, they handed the Network Readiness Index back to me and my colleague, Bruno Lanva, who was also one of the initial group of four who helped create the index. And so we created a not-for-profit think tank in Washington, DC called Portulans Institute. And Portulans now, in fact, uh, publishes the Network Readiness Index. And I will talk a little bit about it in my comments now that will follow. Just one small comment on the name Portulans. It refers to the old maps of navigation that sailors used when people did not know 
what the contours of the various continents were. You know, people are discovering what the continents looked like, where the land masses were. And so they were incomplete maps, but they were maps that basically, you know, were used then to be able to help navigate the environment. And we really believe that technology, innovation, these kinds of issues, it's a very similar story right now. You know, we see some contours of the land around us. We see some contours of, uh, you know, impact, but I don't think so really understand the full scale of the impact. I don't think so really fully understand where, you know, the boundaries end or where the boundaries sometimes begin. And this is also the reason why, you know, you have major universities like Stanford University in 2016, they launched a hundred year study in AI. So Stanford University publicly committed to study AI for the next hundred years. And the reason they chose to make this you know, broad and bold declaration was simply because they said, look, you know, the actual impacts of AI are so broad. You know, there's not just technologies covering issues around ethics, around morality, around privacy, around security, around you know, autonomy, around safety. And it represents perhaps a deep rethinking of what society and business looks like in the future. And we cannot expect that we will understand all these implications over the next five years or 10 years. So in fact, we believe that we need at least 100 years and maybe longer to fully understand the implications of what is happening around us. And I think as a preamble out here to you know, the slides, I'll show you a few slides in a few minutes. It's also important to keep in mind that uh, you know, we are really now living in that vertical hockey stick part of an exponential curve. You know, we all hear of the term that we all live in exponential trends, exponential times, but I'm not fully sure we fully understand the implications of it, you know, because as human beings, we are more used to linear works. We live and think in linear frames and we suffer from some natural cognitive biases that actually prevent us from thinking actively in exponential worlds. You know, for example, we rely too much on system one thinking. We have an anchoring bias. You know, we often think what happened in the last two years is going to define what happened in the next two years. But the impact of exponential trends is tremendous. You know, if you think of, for example, you know, the simplest example I often take when I teach students is you make a linear series. And let's assume every year you add an incremental one. So you go from one, two, three, four, and 30 years, you hit 30. And you might think, well, great, in 30 years, we have actually increased that quantity by 30 times. You take a simple exponential series, two to the power of one, two to the power of two, two to the power of three every year. And you move 30 years, you get two to the power of 30. Two to the power of 30 is essentially one billion. The difference between 1 billion and 30 is really the difference that represents the impact of magnitude of change between a linear and an exponential world. And human beings, we are not very good at imagining exponential worlds. But the reality is that today, after I would say almost 45 years of exponential growth, Moore's law has been active since 1965, after almost you know, 45 years of Moore's law or more, uh, we essentially are seeing the computational ability, the data availability double every 12 to 18 months. And the pace of this doubling is in fact increasing, it's not decreasing. You know, Most people thought that Moore's law would flatten out and probably not be active after you know, 2010 or 25, 2005 or something. But there are no signs of it slowing down. All the technology progress, and in fact, the future progress in quantum computing and so on, all of it is directed towards more and more rapid progress. So what it really means is that the future is actually very exciting. The future has many more possibilities and the future will open up new horizons. You know, it doesn't really matter if, for example, we could not 
or did not make use of technology capabilities in the past because there'll be new ones available and they will be coming at a faster rate than what we can imagine. This is also what is termed as this era of abundance and we're living in as for example, Peter Diamandis, who is the founder of Singularity University has written in his book of abundance. So we are living in this abundance of opportunities. And I think technology is really going to open up many more opportunities in the future. And that is exciting for countries like India because India and other emerging markets can actually now be active players in this emerging space of new opportunities. But if we do not have the right governance structures in place, if we do not have the right human capital in place, we do not have the right kind of technology policies in place, we will not necessarily be able to leverage all these different uh, new possibilities. So I really do believe that this focus on governance that I think Shyam and the Inter International Center is leading is very important. And we are reaching a point at which, you know, we don't debate whether the technology is having a strong impact on us. We know it is. But what we do not fully realize is that the impact is speeding up and speeding up exponentially. And that this impact is going to move at a faster and faster pace in the years ahead. And that will imply that we actually have to become much more agile much more sophisticated, much more holistic in our views of governance of technology. Now, if you allow me, I'm going to uh, share a few slides just so that I am able to share with you uh, a perspectives about this network readiness index. I hope you're able to see my slide and all the information that I'm sharing with you is all publicly available. So you can in fact, uh, you know, search for it in the search engine of your choice and you will get information about it. it is all free. You can download all the information for free. So I'll share some results from the latest index of 2021, which was released in December of last year. So a few months ago. And my goal out here is not to go into the precise rankings or anything of that kind of detail. I'll probably skim through some of those slides. My goal is to show to you what can be a one possible conceptual architecture for thinking about technology. And also important is uh, how can we in fact, uh, you know, move forward. So what are some of the issues and challenges that we see moving forward? So I just want to thank my colleagues and the team who are in fact part of this project. And of course, I mentioned Bruno earlier. So Bruno was one of the co-founders of this along with me some years ago, but other members of the team who played a very important role are also listed out here. And thanks to them for this success of this project. So I will divide my presentation, you know, the more formal part of it into three brief components. The first one, I'll talk a little bit about the NRI, the Network Readiness Index. I'll very briefly talk about some rankings and key findings you know, from this year's results. There's a lot of data and a lot of information you can digest out there. And I will not try to give you too much information because it can be an overload of information in a short presentation like this. But I'll focus more on the part three, which is the key messages and takeaways that we can take from this year's and from our work uh, that we have been doing in this area. You know, just as a background, as a comparison, um, we started this Network Readiness Index in 2002. And around the same time, the other global index that was started is the one from the ITU. Uh, so ITU had a development index and ITU development index was always more technology oriented, much more sort of focused on the nitty gritty details of technology while the network readiness index was more focused on the broader issues of how societies, countries can leverage uh, uh, technology. For a number of different reasons, the ITU index actually has been stopped uh, for the last three years. So in effect, right now, this index the network readiness index is the most, you know, only really available global index that has a long longevity in this area of technology, which I think is very important today. Technology is very critical and we really are, and we should be looking at ways to analyze it much more conceptually and much more deeply. So let me begin with what is the NRI? I told you that we started with a very, 
you know, futuristic view, that time of looking at the environment, looking at uh, usage. And then in 2018, we did another major review of the model because obviously the kind of issues that are there on the table today with technology have evolved quite a bit. So in this uh, 2018 major review, we modified to some degree the NRI model. And as Shia mentioned earlier, the model today has four pillars. And I can express the philosophy behind the model in this very simple terms is that our collective future will really require a harmonious integration of people and technology. So our future in multiple ways in society and sectors really depends upon combining people and technology together with the right governance structure to create the right impact. And I say technology also because technology is becoming more intelligent. As we know with AI, technology is becoming like an equal or at least quasi equal partner to people. So how do we combine technology and people together effectively, I think is the key thrust of this NRI model. If you look at some of the sub blocks out there, you will see elements that are new. You know, we had not considered elements like trust and inclusion explicitly in the initial models. But today we know that given the challenges and digital divides, inequality that we in society around us, these kinds of issues of trust, inclusion, the quality of life, the SDG contributions, all of these become extremely important. If you think today, it is sometimes shocking to actually realize that more than 40%, you know, roughly about 42, 43% of the world's population, even today does not have workable access to the internet. This might be due for a number of reasons. They may not have access to the bandwidth, they may not have access to a device, or they may not just simply have the skills to actually access what they need to access. But for different reasons, what you find is that uh, it is quite shocking that in this today's digital era, about half the world's population is being left behind completely. So inclusion is very important. And this issue became very important also in the COVID time. In the COVID time, we saw how even in rich societies, you know, I read a statistic that in Manhattan, which is one of the richest cities you know, in the world, or richest part of a city in the world, about 22% of households did not have broadband access to the internet during the COVID pandemic. So you had many children who could not actually access schooling properly from homes, or who had to go and sit outside Starbucks and McDonald's, you know, the restaurants to be able to do their homework if they were allowed to do so. So inclusion is a very, very important part of reality of life. You think of, for example, this whole focus on technology for good, which is there in the world around us. And we know the sustainable development goals are very important if you want to create a more equal world. At the same time, we all know that, you know, situation right now, on one hand, doesn't look very promising. A lot of people are questioning whether we'll reach the sustainable development goals or not, whether prescribed, you know, goal 2030. But at the same time, on the more promising side, uh, people also know that many of the solutions for achieving them today exist in some form. And the solutions are actually heavily technology enabled. For example, um, there is no way that we can produce enough school teachers. If you want to reach the SDG goal education, we will have to deploy a technology enabled model. There is no way we'll have enough doctors and nurses in the world. If you want to have affordable quality healthcare for everyone, we will have to deploy a model that uses technology effectively. So technology does enter into so many different parts. And what this NRI model does really is it tries to bring these things in some kind of an explicit focus. Now, uh, we have a theme every year. This year's theme was the global recovery. And of course, everyone is concerned about, you know, in the post-COVID world, how will the global recovery shape up? 
Of course, when we did the study last December, we didn't anticipate the current Ukraine-Russia conflict, which is having another tremendous impact on the global recovery. But uh, looking at technology alone, I think uh, there's an interesting question is that, you know, do we actually see technology increasing inequality or can we actually use technology to reduce inequality? This is the classical difference between a K-shape versus a V-shape recovery. A lot of people are fearful that, in fact, technology is increasing inequality. Uh, there's increasing concentration of capabilities, increasing concentration of wealth uh, to those companies that are using technology more effectively, to those nations that are using technology more intensively. And there's a real concern about even inside a country uh, are, for example, the rural population or the people of less access to technology are less educated being left behind. So these kinds of concerns are actually getting magnified the discussions around inequality are getting magnified by technology. And we see that in many ways. You know, technology is a great amplifier. It can, in fact, uh, increase the divides if it is not handled and managed effectively. The second part of the presentation is very briefly the rankings. I will not intend, I don't intend to go through them in a lot of detail. There's a lot of data out there. But just to share with you uh, what can be, let's say, at a very high level, uh, let's say the countries at the very top. The list of countries is not too surprising. So I think if you look at the names out there, they are names that you probably would expect to be there in the top. And what is interesting is that, uh, you know, if you look at the top 25, all of them are high income economies. And that raises an interesting question of correlation versus causality. You know, is it the case that they are high income because they've invested a lot in technology? Or is it the case that, uh, you know, because they are able to afford the technology, they actually able to keep on investing in a fruitful manner in technology in a continuous way? Or does technology in fact create all the high income which they benefit from? So a lot of these questions are there and we have to actually you know, often look at this data carefully <clears throat> to analyze how and why these dynamics happen. But we also see some countries like China and Malaysia that are actually moving up, the middle income economies that are closing the gap and moving up. But there is a strong dominance of the high income economies uh, if you look at uh, by each pillar, and of course, each pillar is uh, measured by different variables, you see different countries out there ranking in the top three. The US is clearly very, very strong in technology. It comes up extremely heavily because, as you can imagine, the US is investing a lot of money in R&D. US companies are doing a lot in technology. And other elements also are important and you can go back and actually look and see why are some countries ranked, for example, why is Norway ranked high on governance or why is Singapore ranked high on impact? We can learn lessons. So these all countries and example, the rankings afford us lessons that can be transferred to other countries uh, in an appropriate manner. We also have rankings by income group. And it offers us the similar kind of a perspective. So you know, given the range of data that we have, we can cut and slice the data in different ways. And so here we have you know, another slice of the data by income group. And you see India at position number 67 has gone up significantly this year by more than 20 positions. But also what you see in the low income countries, you see names like Rwanda and Tajikistan and Gambia uh, which are interesting names. So you see that these are countries that are in fact uh, moving up, you know, and doing better and better. So I think you see signs of hope at all income level groups inside uh, this ranking. You can also do a ranking by region. And again, you have different, uh, you know, another different slice of the ranking that can be made. And, uh, you know, there are many different ways of slicing and dicing the data that is interesting for analysis of the data. If you do a correlation or at least some kind of a mapping of the vertical axis, which is the NRI score, with the GDP per capita in PPP terms on the horizontal axis, 
what you see is that there is some kind of a linear curve. So as the countries get richer, the NRI scores go higher. And I told you the causality link out here is an interesting one, is that does in fact technology create the wealth? In fact, because you have wealth, you can actually create the technology and use the technology more is an interesting question. But you clearly see some countries that are you know, performing above the curve, like India. The India is a big green bubble in the middle. So that's the size of the bubble of the population. You see India performing well. And you see, for example, China also performing well. And then you see really some of the richer economies at the top end of the curve with higher GDP per capita also doing well. In general, if you observe, what we find is that, uh, you know, we have done various analysis of the data. And what we find is that countries that are much more intensively using digital technologies typically do much better in their GDP per capita growth rates and their overall competitiveness. And this is another reason why you find that US does typically better economically than many countries in Europe, because the US economy typically uses technology or US companies use technology much more intensively than many economies in Europe. Now, I would let me sort of just go through a few key messages. I'll be brief in the description of the messages, and then I'm sure we can pick up on some of them in the discussion that will follow. So the first message that we really you know, find from the study is that COVID has turned digital transformation from a priority into global imperative. Today is no longer a question of choice. It is something which uh, has to happen and countries have to basically get engaged with the digital transformation. And the transformation has got accelerated as we know in this COVID phenomena. And because of this hockey stick exponential trend, there is no sign that the pace of transformation is gonna slow down once that COVID at least becomes less severe in its impact. So there's a need right now of all countries and all sectors, and in fact, of everyone, including, for example, in my own education business, for us to be much more bold in experimenting, much more bold in trying out new business models, and to have the courage to move forward. Because the world tomorrow is going to change and be a different world, and we have to create it more proactively as opposed to just be let it happen in some kind of a ad hoc manner. Another message that we see is the message of inequality I emphasized earlier. We are in fact finding the digital divide, not just a significant barrier that continues, but in fact, unfortunately is increasing in many ways. And this is not a very happy news because we see how digital transformation is impacting people's lives, the competitiveness of, nation, of nations very strongly. So it's very important that we somehow have the right governance policies in place to address this, because if it is not addressed, this divide is increasing. Let's not get fooled that just because more and more people have mobile phones, the digital divide is closed. That is not true. The digital divide in terms of quality of access, the quality of uh, technology available devices, the quality of the skills, the quality of knowledge is all increasing right now. And it needs the concerted effort from government, business and multiple stakeholders to address this. What we also know, and this is a message of hope, is that the, like a comment I made about the SDG goals earlier, for the global recovery and to make it more equal technology is the only solution out here. We'll never have enough doctors, never have enough teachers. So we'll have to have technology enabled means to try to equalize and try to help achieve both the global recovery and also in fact, the achievement of sustainable development goals. So we have to ensure that, uh, you know, as economies approach and adopt the right kind of stimulus fiscal packages, they also prioritize investments in using technology for helping achieve the SDG goals. You know, if you look at, for example, the COVID times, a lot of the economic packages that were done in many countries just were aimed at helping people survive 
the job losses, the survive the COVID pandemic negative impacts. But you have to move beyond the survival stage, which is important, and move towards building the future. And this is something which is very important going forward is that technology can be a very important part of that building the future message. This message number four is something that we have seen over the last several years. You know, if you think about what does it take to build network readiness in a country, it is not a question of doing one thing here and one thing there. It's not a question of just putting more computers in school or more iPads in schools. You have to work on multiple dimensions. And if you don't really have that multi-dimensional approach, a holistic approach to using technology effectively in a country, the country or the economy will not be able to benefit from it. And what we have, find is, what we have found is that all the countries that have done well on the index over time they have balanced dynamic economies that excel in multiple areas and demonstrate strong performances across all pillars of the NRI. So you need to have good governance approaches, need to have good investment in people, need to have good investment technology to be able to make that happen. For example, talking about India, right now, India needs to invest more in advanced technology and AI technology. India is behind on the global scene in terms of advanced investment in AI. So this is an area of example, if India does not invest in AI enough, it'll be left behind and it'll, unable, it'll be unable to take the benefits of AI in the future. So that holistic approach of technology, people, all of this is very, very important for every economy. I think today what happens also, what we see is that uh, economies can leverage technology and move up. So if you have a coherent strategy, if you have a good governance uh, framework, you can actually move ahead. And that is very important. India certainly has helped, you know, has moved ahead by using technology quite a bit, but you also see many African countries doing the same. So what we mean by a fair game at this point really is that the technology barriers are there, but they're not insurmountable. You can, with a good governance framework, good policies, actually leverage technology and move forward at a national level and make progress for your own people. Also, what we see is that some countries are actually helping and moving forward more rapidly. China, Ukraine, Vietnam, India, Rwanda are some of the economies that have closed the performance gap across income groups in our own study. And once again, there are useful lessons that we can take about how are some of these countries moving ahead. And certainly for our viewers in India, uh, India has done tremendous efforts in technology, you know, some by the private sector from Reliance, which spread telecoms across the country in a cheap subsidized manner, and the government that set up Aadhaar and the whole India stack and other kinds of initiatives that have really helped push uh, e-commerce and democratize the whole digital business in India tremendously. And those are very important lessons that other countries can, for example, take from India's example. Like India, there are useful lessons in each of the countries and we can learn from them. For example, Rwanda has a very liberal open policy towards drone experimentations. Rwanda has become you know, very advanced in some drone application because the country has really enabled the more experimentation in drone technology. Maybe one more final lesson is really that connectivity is not really an end in itself. The ultimate goal is to create value for societies. And this really comes back to the notion of what is the purpose of technology? The purpose of technology is not to just create the next tool. The purpose of technology is to in fact, create a better life for people as it's technology for the good of all and to create value for societies. But however, this will not happen uh, just by you know, some kind of a desire that it happens. You need to invest in a proper technology and policy framework. You need to invest in a proper governance framework. You need to invest in people and you need to somehow ensure that we are doing good for society. We are doing good for our people, whether it's society, whether it's business, whether it's government, by using technology effectively. I think India has made some very important steps in this, in this direction. The government 
understands the importance of uh, technology clearly. And in fact, I'm very pleased that the Ministry of IT and Telecoms, you know, they are using the Network Readiness Index, you know, very carefully. We are in a dialogue with them about this. And uh, they are now, in fact, uh, what they tell me is that they're going to be rolling out a state-level version of uh, Indian customized version of the NRI that is more attuned to the Indian specific projects and the Indian specific sort of needs of society. I'm very pleased to see that happen. And clearly that will be another step in which you know, the states and the India as a whole will have a more conceptual anchor and a framework to think about governance and technology progress in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. I hand it back to you, Sham. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sumita, for uh, this very, very uh, you know, illuminating uh, uh, presentation uh, by you. Um, May I uh, perhaps begin the uh, question answer session by just posing a couple of questions uh, to you. And these uh, appear to me as almost uh, existential questions because um, I mean, what do you have uh, shown uh, in terms of the index? Uh, clearly there is a correlation between network readiness and uh, income levels. Uh, that means those countries which are you know, have a higher uh, wealth and income uh, are the ones who are perhaps uh, much more able uh, to take care of or, or to, to utilize the, uh, you know, tremendous possibilities that uh, technology has opened up. You mentioned in the beginning that this is an age of great abundance and opportunity that technology is, is actually uh, opening out the vistas that are being opened out uh, to us. Uh, but we also see from your index that much of that great abundance is <laughs> probably being, you know, leveraged more by those who are already, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, wealthy. And um, uh, the problem uh, problem is that uh, the uh, lower income developing countries uh, simply do not have the resources uh, because they are not as rich. Uh, to be able to uh, not only fully utilize the opportunities that are available, but because of the factor that you mentioned, that this is a kind of a curve which is like a hockey stick going up, uh, you have to keep uh, you know ahead of the curve uh, because otherwise, right. uh, even as you are I I even as you are progressing, um, you are you are in always in danger of always falling behind because there is no steady state in a sense, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, does technology itself offer uh, some solution to this uh, problem? I mean, are there ways in which uh, without perhaps too much of expenditure in terms of human resources or material resources, uh, are there affordable, you know, and perhaps very uh, cost effective uh, technology solutions possible uh, for for us to be able to overcome some of these uh, some of these disadvantages. Yeah, so it's a very important question you're raising, Sham, and the answer is yes and yes, but okay. So yes, why? Because today, for example, technology has improved a lot, and even a small business, a startup in India, can access uh, advanced cloud-based solutions. You know, there are many services available with advanced security, advanced services available in the cloud easily. So access to many advanced software services has become easier today because of technology progress. And that's available to any you know, startup, any small company, small business, anywhere in the world. So that's good sign. But, and the but comes from here is that you cannot actually get the full benefits if you do not have a national policy or national vision for using technology. So let's look at India as a good example, a case study. Uh, India started with the whole Aadhaar implementation almost 10 years ago. And imagine if the government did not have the vision to start the Aadhaar implementation 10 years ago, uh, what would be the situation today? You know, India would be much more hampered in putting businesses online. India would not be able to build the India stack of APIs. India would not be able to democratize lots of you know, basic payment system mechanisms and other kinds of UPI success stories that we have seen in India. So a lot of the success in digitalization in India has happened because the government had a strategy and the government actually implemented the strategy. I don't think it was a question of 
lack of resources necessarily. You know, yes, it was expensive to do it, but I don't think the expense is something that is a major bottleneck. So my own experience is, is in most countries, it is a lack of vision and a lack of strategy that prevents countries from really leveraging the whole digital technology effectively. Again, to take the case of India, just to, just to, just to continue on that example, I remember very clearly 15, 18 years ago, you know, the talk always was India's ahead in software and digital technologies. And uh, China is in fact uh, uh, good in manufacturing, but behind in software and digital technologies. And today, if you look at the story, the story is no longer the same. You know, China has many successful digital companies. Uh, and China has moved very rapidly and one might argue even ahead of India in many areas of digital technologies. How did that happen and why did it happen? You know, partly because China was ahead further than India on the uh, whole telecom adoption, you know, the mobile phone adoption curve. China was about seven, eight years earlier than India on that the dimension. And second, the Chinese government actually made investments in digital technologies a much more national priority slightly earlier on. So what you see is that with the right kind of government leadership, the right kind of investments that don't think so are huge, uh, you can in fact get countries to move forward. So my butt comes from, yes, technology is lowering access, but without a national vision, national policy, that will not necessarily lead to the right kind of outcomes. Let me, um, thank you, uh, uh, Sumitra. Let me just uh, also pose a couple of questions that have been raised. One, you had mentioned that, you know, if you take sectors like health or education, uh, there is simply no way that uh, we can meet the challenges of uh, health and education uh, in the in the in the coming days uh, unless we rely on on technology uh, and and that's that's something which is uh, also uh, we have the experience uh, during the pandemic itself uh, that we actually were forced to uh, use technology in order to convey uh, to deliver education uh, the question which is uh, asked is that you know Obviously, it is not only a question of, you know, technology. I mean, the way you teach digitally is very different that, than what you would teach, uh, you know, in a physical uh, classroom. Uh, the manner in which uh, you hold the attention of students who are on the other, you know, on, on the screen, perhaps in their homes or perhaps in other locations, uh, is very more challenging than, <laughs> again, a face-to-face -face, uh, kind of uh, encounter with them. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it, as I said, it's not only a question of the having access to network, having access to technology, but, you know, there, it, there is also that the whole nature of education, the content and the manner in which you deliver it, that too, uh, we have found that uh, it has changed. Any, I mean, as a teacher yourself uh, and having been through <laughs> this challenging period, any thoughts that you could offer to us? Uh, because that's one of the questions that I've No, made. absolutely. I think the question is very correct. And the way we do things has to change. And even the business model has to change. So yes, that uh, specific question you're asking, teachers need to be trained and they have to have the skills in how to do and teach effectively online. Because online, you have a different kind of attention span. You have different kind of engagement modes. Uh, you have a different kind of ways of creating discussions. So how do you do this effectively is something that teachers need education in. You know, I was part of a small team <clears throat> that created a whole program that we ran all successfully uh, that helped educate teachers about what works and what does not work and how do you actually teach effectively online. And sometimes even just simple sharing of experiences across teachers is very useful. Yeah. So <clears throat> there is an important element of education reskilling. This is the reskilling issue that happens in any domain. But beyond the reskilling of the people, <clears throat> there's also an important issue in terms of uh, what is the business model? Because now suddenly, you know, if education is becoming much more atom sized, you know, much more smaller bits and becoming you know, different kind of chunks, do we still need uh, 
exams, you know, of the kind that we have done in the past. You know, we didn't have 12 standard exams. We didn't have A-level exams the first time. You know, this is like historical. And, you know, we survived. You know, students actually did, you know, go to colleges and did actually, you know, learn. The question really is, what are the kind of assessments required? That actually do we, is the kind of assessment that we have accepted for a long time, is that the right assessment? We have to maybe rethink assessments. The kind of curriculum we have in schools, you know, is that the right curriculum? We've got to rethink the curriculum. Uh, the kind of program structure we have, you know, today we have, for example, the undergraduate program is three years or four years, depending on which country you are in. You know, is that kind of a three, four year structure the right structure? Should we give more flexibility and give people flexibility to do, combine this with more work, you know, experiences and so on, and give people the flexibility to combine experiences across multiple schools? The whole idea of stackable certificates, stackable degrees. Can you take certificates and chunks of learning from one school, apply it in another school, and combine the third school? So these all are also broader business model issues. So really, if you think about what technology enables is a rethinking of the entire business model. And then that also requires a change in the entire governance structure, a change in the investment platforms. Yeah. So for example, uh, in universities, most universities have invested so much money in buildings. You know, if you don't need buildings as much, you know, is the right investment of money in buildings as opposed to something else. Yeah. So I think we have to rethink the whole system and clearly coming back to the original question, the people and teacher reskilling and retraining is absolutely essential. It's an investment that you have to make in, yeah. in the educational resources. Yeah. Therefore, the, I mean, the challenge becomes even more complex, uh, especially where governance systems are not quite <laughs> as efficient as we would uh, expect them uh, to be. Uh, we have very little time, but I want to, um, you know, uh, pose to you a question which has been asked, which I think in terms of, you know, the people's focus is very important. And this is that um, when we are talking about, say, digital divide or digital literacy, uh, one, of the, one of the great challenges is that we have a large senior citizen population. <laughs> I include myself uh, in that uh, category. And uh, in many countries, I mean, you know, the, the age profile is changing uh, and you have very much more, uh, you know, older citizens uh, where digital literacy is really a very, very important practical problem. You know, how to, how to do your, you know, digital uh, internet banking or, uh, you know, fund transfer, just using, for example, the digital payment system <laughs> itself uh, mm -hmm. can be sometimes become very challenging for, uh, for uh, a senior citizen. Uh, the issue of uh, security, because, you know, there are any number of scams which are going on. And if you are not really very mindful of what these kind of, uh, you know, risks are, uh, you know, a lot of senior citizens actually, uh, actually fall prey to these kind of scams. Uh, is there something that uh, with respect to this rather vulnerable uh, part of the population, uh, any thoughts that you can offer about what can we perhaps do uh, to, to uh, you know, safeguard their interests? Yeah, so I think, you know, it's a very important segment of our population, a growing segment in many countries. And I think technology is becoming an integral part of their lives too, all senior elderly people. It's a very important part of the care at home, and a very important part of security at home, you know. Uh, you have a lot of people who are concerned about, you know, being in touch with elderly people. Loneliness is a very important issue and human social contact is very important. Technology plays a very key role out there. So I think the good news is the user experience with technology is becoming easier and easier. So if you look at, for example, how easy it is to use video conferencing today, how easy it is to use, uh, you know, Netflix today. Uh, all this is getting easier and easier. So it's not, no, I'm not saying it's always easy, but it's getting easier and easier, the user experience. So in that sense, it's becoming easier for elderly to use. Clearly, a lot of software companies are also focused on trying to make the interface better for elderly people. Like for example, allowing larger font size, you know, people often have poor eyesight and even simple things like having larger font size easily and so on can help a great deal. Now, also what is important is we need to do the kind of reskilling and investment in people, elderly people for living lives productively and effectively and safely uh, you know, at every stage of the, of, the, of the lives. 
So that kind of investment in helping educate elderly people through whether community centers, other kind of social efforts is also very important. And even allowing people to, you know, uh, I would connect with each other socially. People learn from each other very actively. So I would say it's a combination of multiple efforts. There is no one thing that will solve the challenge that we're facing. But I think it's a combination of multiple things. And we are moving in the right direction. If you ask me, I mean, we're not actually going in the wrong direction. We are moving in the right direction in which things are becoming easier and easier for elderly people to use, especially as AI comes in. In the picture, you have more intelligent agents that are able to talk to you. The human interface, you don't have to even type necessarily, just talking to you know agents and talking to digital devices might be actually quite convenient. So yeah. the, even the interface of how you talk to people, talk to machines, is evolving and becoming more and more user friendly. So the direction is actually in the right direction. The user experience is becoming easier and better. Okay. The challenge for us is to find the right application that will add the highest value to elderly yeah. people. Yeah. Okay. So uh, would you be generous and give us time for one more question? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think, uh, you know, several, there are many questions, so I'm <laughs> afraid we can't satisfy all of them. Uh, but some of the things that have been raised, you have already answered, you know, the, the issue of, you know, uh, does, does uh, income, high income give you greater possibility of uh, leveraging technology and, uh, you know, some of the questions being asked, you know, um, how do we, how do we really, uh, you know, I mean, so far the experience has been that inequality has been increasing as a result of technological advancement. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, merely talking about a holistic approach is not really uh, quite uh, giving the uh, answer. But you have, I, I think you have addressed that it is it is a challenge. Uh, and there are many ways in which we can we can address it. But one of the questions uh, that uh, has arisen, and I think it is important, is in terms of you know the employment issue, the the mm -hmm. jobs issue. Uh, that uh, you know when we are talking about this technological advancement and change, uh, there is also the issue of you know what happens to what happens to jobs, what happens to employment. Uh, are there going to be large sections of the population who are really won't have anything to do? To, to do? Uh, are we going to be thinking in terms of some kind of a universal basic income? Because, you know, wealth will increase, but uh, do we do something on the distribution side in order to address this? Um, what are the ways in which this particular aspect can be uh, yeah. can be addressed? It's, it's a very important question. So when you talk to politicians and the policy level, the relationship between technology progress and jobs is fundamental because obviously if people's jobs are being threatened as by some people say AI technologies, it affects the very fabric of society. You know, it affects the very dignity of people because often dignity of people is linked to the ability to right. be able to have a job and bring, you know, food on the table for their family. Now, I think the... There are two sides to the story out here. So one side actually is, of course, that lots of people are very scared that AI technology is going to take away jobs. And I read stories about how, you know, in America, for example, 15% of adult males are driving something. Uh, now, if the trucks are becoming autonomous and cars are becoming autonomous, then if the jobs go away, you know, what do you do with a 40-year-old truck driver? Uh, it's great that the 40-year-old truck driver doesn't have to drive a truck, but, you know, can you convert him or her into a, you know, a data scientist or AI researcher? You know, it's not easy to do. So the reskilling effort might be tremendous and very painful for some segment of society. And that's a major challenge for, for government because you require, you know, a multi-stakeholder approach effort from business, society, and government to be able to take these people and, and move them to a different kind of environment because, you know, even universal basic income, it's not clear that will solve the problem. You know, even if you take a truck driver and give him $1,000 and say, okay, you know, you sit at home, you know, and the question really is, is that really a happy, productive person that you have, that you're creating out there and that, and that in the process? So I think people need a purpose to life. I think the purpose of life is also very important. So I think it's, it's an interesting question, open question. On the other side, uh, if you look at, for example, there's so many young people in India or people in India who need jobs, um, technology is also enabling them to get jobs in the gig economy. You know, so a number of people are working, you know, with all our drivers or whether it's working on some kind of a, an outsourced gig workers for people in the Western developed economies. 
Um, not all the gig work is great work. Some of it is low paid work, uh, but a lot of it also can be very good work. If you're a designer in India, you can sit and design products and design designs for people in the Western you know, customers get paid more for your services. So I think, you know, um, technology is also increasing the access to jobs for many people in emerging markets. Now, the question really is how fast will economies evolve, you know, and to be able to help create the new jobs, because you need to help create the new jobs in the economy because technology is enabling new jobs to be created. And you also help, uh, you've got to invest in the reskilling of people to enable them to take the new jobs. AI is a good case in point right now. I mentioned earlier, India is behind an AI. You know, uh, it's only recently that uh, Niti Aayog came up with an AI strategy. It's only, you know, it's, it's, it's very early stages in India, the whole AI story. And if you think about it, AI is going to create tremendous change in society. Tremendous jobs are going to be created with AI. But you need to actually have the people who can do those kind of jobs, the people who can create the AI systems. So you need more investment in AI in the various institutions and the various companies. So it's a complex, multi-stakeholder approach that is required. And the job story is, you know, a story that has both the difficult side and also the positive side. And I think we have to ensure that the end net result, even though some people will be more difficult than others, uh, end net result of society is positive and that we support the people for whom it's difficult as best as possible, yeah. but not an easy challenge. Uh -huh. That's why you need good leadership, yeah. I think, these yeah. days. Well, um, uh, Sovita, it's very nice at least that you have ended on a rather positive and optimistic note. I think we need that. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you that uh, we do have a, a huge number of possibilities which have been opened up thanks to uh, technology. And I think we should try and find ways in which we can really uh, leverage that uh, for for more inclusive kind of, uh, you know, social and uh, economic uh, development. I, uh, we have run out of time and there are still a lot of questions, but uh, I must apologize to all our, uh, you know, uh, very distinguished group of people who have been listening to your fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, perhaps we must get you back again <laughs> so that you can give us uh, a, a little more, little more uh, insight uh, into this absolutely fascinating uh, subject. Thank you very much, Sumitra, for taking time off uh, to uh, be with us and uh, helping us to celebrate uh, this uh, important anniversary for the India International Center. Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much, Sherman. I wish you and the center very, very, very best. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All the best to you in your new assignment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.